We've had a really interesting morning here at Henley Business School in South Africa, uh, talking about issues around women's diversity in the boardroom and how they're climbing the ladder and whether we've got a strong enough pipeline. And we've had a really four interesting panelists who've come from different walks of life to be able to share their experiences. And I think for me, probably there were three things that really stood out. First of all, looking at communication. Although the room was full of women, there were a few men here. And I think what we all felt is this is a conversation that needs to be had much more broadly. And we really need to engage not just with women, but with men so that we really understand our differences and our strengths. I guess the second thing is that ultimately we've come a long way, but there's still a long way to go. And it's not just because we're different or we can't challenge. There's some real systemic and cultural issues here. And therefore we were talking about actually it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And we have to keep thinking about how do we role model? How do we make sure that next generation of young boys and young girls see women in leadership positions? And then that brings me to the final point, which is, okay, women do bring different strengths. We are different and we have to acknowledge we're different. And we shouldn't be afraid of being different because some of those differences bring real strength to, to leadership. We see the big picture. We have great emotional intelligence. And I think women just have to be strong and comfortable in that and be brave in how they deal with it. And overall, I just think it was a really inspiring and insightful conversation, which I was proud to be part of. What we've got today is a panel who I want us as a community to help reflect on some of the issues in organizations. How do we start to build that pipeline? How do we support women? What are the cultural issues that we might need to tackle? Now, we don't have all the answers and I don't have all the questions. You're part of this debate and therefore, from the comments I've made so far, start to think about what are things you want us to hear us talk about? Because I really do want to make sure that our conversation is a conversation that when you walk away, you think, oh, that's an interesting perspective or that's a neat idea. Maybe I can borrow that example from X organization and bring into mine. So that's what I'm really hoping we achieve today. But before we get started, I'm going to ask each of my panel members just to briefly introduce themselves. You've got their full bios in the little booklet. But just so that you understand the context from which their comments come, I think it's quite important that they give you a little bit of their own personal background. Jules. Hi, everybody. I'm Jules Newton, Managing Director of Avocado Vision, which is a BTS company. I started Avocado Vision 21 years ago. I just got my LinkedIn anniversary congratulations that I have been in one job as Managing Director for 21 years. And I am one of those women who stepped out of a corporate place and started my own thing because I was bloody irritated at the very masculine, uncomfortable corporate space that actually I knew I could create something better. So I've spent 21 years running a very female-based organization where we have created our own way of being in the world and being you know, highly functional, highly professional, and performing well. Great. Fantastic. Uh Arty. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name's Arthi Vabikrasoon. I'm currently a business development executive at All Mutual Investment Group. Um, my journey in my career started about 13 to 14 years ago, so it's fairly young in terms of corporate career. But I think where my context and background actually comes from is actually seeing the progression or my ability to progress in, in companies from junior up until a very senior management position now. It's not been easy. There's been a lot of these biases that we're going to talk about today. Um, but it's about actually being able to break through that. Um, so even though I am uh, fully employed in terms of Old Mutual, I've actually been able to start my own businesses. Um, I'm a business investor. I'm a coach. Um, so there's a lot of things that I'm able to do um, outside of the corporate world, which then gives me a very nice view in terms of what is achievable and how you can actually break that glass ceiling to do what you need to do. So that's, that's the kind of context that I'm going to be coming from today. Great. Thanks. Ray. Hi, everyone. My name is Ray White. I work for 702. I'm not sure if you guys listen to 702. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good answer. Good start the morning. Um, I, I, I've been in radio for 23 years now, and I've had the luxury of, since 1994, 
being able to see this country and how it's moved and how it's evolved. And just as Jenny was saying, at the SABC, when it started out, when I first got there, it was white male, elderly, <laughs> gray pants, gray shoes, blue blazer, and white shirt and a tie. And that's what they had. And they would walk around there. Women progression didn't happen. It didn't happen whatsoever. But things have changed since then. Things have absolutely changed. So it's been very interesting to see how the business world is evolving. The question is, is it evolving because of legislation, because the rules are there, or is it evolving because people want it that way and people are now progressing that way? So interesting panel discussion this morning about that. So if you have any questions, things you want to know, Specifically, even about even about the radio world, you you turn on your radio and you're here reading Kabi, you're here Tara Penny reading the news. Does that make you happier to hear? Um, where are we with radio? Are we fulfilling the destination that we're trying to get to? So I'd, I'd like to hear from you. Mm. Great. Hi everyone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sounded loud. <laughs> um, I'm Vasintha Patha, and uh, I have. Spent probably the last 25 years, sounds like I'm the older one in the group, no. <laughs> in uh, probably 50% is in a permanent capacity in organizations and 50% as a consultant, an independent consultant. I work very much in an organizational development change, leadership development space, but I come from a very strong delivery background in project and program management. Um, and one of the things that I've been very passionate about for all of my career is is people development, collaboration, what is it that makes us effective as teams, as collaborators? And diversity is a big part of that conversation as, and of course, partnership as leaders uh, in men and women, and how we uh, manifest that partnership in organizations. And one of the things that I have experienced personally, as I'm sure many of us have here, and that we see in the statistics and we hear out in the space is how much disparity there still is around the representation of uh, women in senior leadership roles. Mm -hmm. And I'm very interested in why that is the case. So a lot of my work is dedicated to looking at cultural systems um, and internal, internal biases, internal ways of being that mm, result in statistics that suggest 20% of women globally occupy senior leadership roles. Right, so I think that set us up really well and there's lots of themes that have already been introduced that I want to explore, but, but I will ask you to put up your hands in a few minutes. So I'll just get the conversation going. And, and Vicente, I'm gonna come back to you because you've talked about the stats and I, I just wanna know that one of the things that the Hampton Alexander report said is that what organizations really need to do is measure and you know you hear, you hear the phrase, if you don't measure, how can you manage? And therefore, how good is that measurement in South Africa? How much do organizations know that it is 20% or 5% or 0%? Um, of course, I'm sure there are many of us that have got more information around this yeah. than me. My, my broad understanding of it is that currently South Africa sits, quite, uh, sits higher and then the rest of Africa in terms of women's representation mm -hmm. on uh, boards yeah. and senior executive roles. And I think as of 2016, we were somewhere around 29%, which beats the global average of 20%. Part of the reason that that is, has occurred, as we understand, is because of legislation and what uh, we have done in terms of, um, of redressing our past issues and legacy of apartheid in South Africa, and redressing that, part of that has been to elevate women leaders in organizations. Mm -hmm. What we, what we, under the literature indicates very alarmingly, however, is that an increase in representation is not necessarily re equating to an increase in power. Right. And those power relations is where the issue yeah. rests. From, a, from an African perspective, yeah. and it, it appears globally that this seems to be shared, is that the senior roles occupied by women are primarily support roles yeah. and therefore don't necessarily have a trajectory yeah. that leads into uh, promotion yeah. and higher accountability yeah. in terms of operational yeah. accountability. And, and, and already from a large business perspective at Old Mutual, is, how do you see that playing out? 
you know, the, the experience within Old Mutual has been quite different. Um, and it's been quite a journey, I think, for this business. Interestingly, I was actually just having a quick look to see what our representation is internally. And I was actually very surprised to find out that we've actually got senior management of, of women representation of around 60% which was actually staggering <laughs> given the, the, the stats that you look at. Yeah. But I really think in terms of the question on, on measurement, um, it's becoming more and more prevalent now where we actually are starting to track this. Mm -hmm. And what I really like is where you're actually tracking it by the type of role that yeah. women play in organizations. It's still very much skewed towards HR. Um, I think the second one was CFOs, CEOs, COOs. But, you know, it's about now how do you actually then filter that into so many more other roles that are then available to women in, in, in business? Yeah. And Jules, have you got a, from a, a small business perspective, you don't, you don't necessarily need to, to measure because it, you see that there. But, but how, how are you trying to address some of the, the balance issues? I mean, you, you, you kind of introduced yourself, which is, I walked away because I got so frustrated. Mm. And, and therefore, talking about creating a more female-oriented organization. Yeah, you know, I've got a bit of a philosophy about that. And I felt it quite strongly. You know, I was, I was young when I was working in a, in a big bank, in fact, uh, corporate. And that is that there's something in the DNA of corporate organizations, which I think is shifting um, now, but it's probably still there more than it should be. The DNA of corporate is masculine. If you think about the language of how we operate, you know, we, we have strategies, we need to win, we, um, you know, we have competitors and we compete against them. And it's all about, you know, fight as hard as you can and win, command and control. And I find that a lot of women, don't reach the very top echelons because you get frustrated and you walk away. And you'll see that the small, small business setup in South Africa has more women startups than men because I think a lot of us step out. Sometimes it's for family reasons and we don't find the corporate DNA compatible with family. And sometimes it's just like me. I actually can't bear being ruled by semi-competent men just because women haven't been allowed to step into those places. It's crazy. And it's not that the men that I'm thinking I'm against men at all. I'm not. Men are fantastic and they're clever and so are women. But not being able to compete on an equal field sometimes used to drive me insane. I think that many of these women-owned um, organizations have more of a feminine DNA. Where you're looking at command and control there, you're here looking at engage and unlock. And, and both of those have huge value. And I think we're strong as a female based organization, we're not exclusively female by any means, because we actually embrace family, um, both male and female. And we, and we create a world where you can be very professional and you can be very competitive, but you can also be a human being in your family. And we are open to having that way of working with our people because we think they'll bring the best of themselves when they are feeling most satisfied with the way that their lives are re running holistically. So I just think we have different ways of looking at the world. And it's actually been quite good for us as a, as a, a feminine type of DNA organization to work alongside the more masculine DNA organizations. You know, corporate companies have been our customers for these 21 years. And that dynamic works quite nicely. Um, but we're just feeling still more comfortable on the outside than we are <laughs> stepping inside. I know many of you are on the inside and needing to actually fight to shift those yeah. ways of being mm -hmm. so that you can be more family friendly. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying family, not woman, no. because I see a lot of stuff um, is, is saying things like, well, women should be able to be given time off to go and fetch their kids. Why woman? No. Yeah. <laughs> Why yeah. not just yeah. family? Yeah, and just I think fair, yeah. that woman leaders kind of get that better. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a really interesting one because I think what I've often seen is organizations develop flexible working policies and, and do all the right things from a policy point of view, but the culture doesn't change. I, I have a, a yeah. wonderful example. I was having a conversation with my son the other day. He's now working as a, 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 a CA in one of the big accounting houses doing these articles. And he's grown up in a family like mine where I've been talking about these things for 20 years. And one of the things that happens in our female organizations is that our women get pregnant. Um, <laughs> I, I Not your man. <laughs> I, I, I tell them that it's a fireable offense, but they ignore me. <laughs> but the interesting thing about pregnant women is that, you know, 
hormones and chemicals govern what happens to you when you're pregnant. It's not just about going on maternity yeah. leave. Yeah. For a while, your brain shifts. Mm -hmm. And lucky for the girls in my organization, I went through a months and months of, of losing my numbers. I could not produce an invoice and check whether it actually added up. I could not tell when something was wrong. And so I, as the woman leader there, know that these are the kind of challenges women face. And the minute somebody falls yeah. pregnant, we have a rule. Yeah. Okay, everybody watch out for this because her brain is going to work in a different way. Not she's bad at her job, yeah. but she is going through a particular phase now where she's going to need different support. Yeah. And because of that language in my home, my son was saying to his boss the other day, who was very, very pregnant, stop this already. You are working far too hard. This is too much stress. You are days away from giving birth. You and your child actually need more peace. Like, let this go. <laughs> Absolutely furious. Because in those kinds of environment, admitting to that kind of thing yeah. feels like weakness. Yeah. Yes. And the minute you are going at, at, at that, a woman aren't allowed to be woman there. And that's mm. where the culture is, I okay. think, the hardest to, to challenge. Ray, Ray, you started by saying that things were changing in the radio business. And, and so how does this resonate with you? It's quite interesting just hearing what she's saying, Jules. I had a reporter this last week come to me saying, my wife's just given birth to twins. Thank you very much for the paternity leave. But I want to come back to work. Because <laughs> I don't want to get home anymore. So I was like, are you sure? He said, no, I, I really want to work this week. <laughs> so it goes both ways. It does go both ways. Yeah. Yeah. Just a question on that. I mean, things have changed at Prime Media, say, for instance. Now, Prime Media, for all those who don't know, got four radio stations, uh, Cape Talk 702, KFM, and 947. And Terry Falkvane was our, was our CEO. She's just left. Omar Essek has taken over. But the whole way as you go down the corporate ladder, is female, which is, mm. which is great. And it's worked very well. The whole dynamic has worked very well. The only thing when it's talking about small business, and Jules, just hearing what you say, it's good. You get angry and you walk away and you go and you start your own business, which is fantastic, which is good. What worries me the most is guys can do that too. Guys mm. can walk away, start their own business, get their friends in, and a little male empire starts and it grows and grows and grows. <laughs> and that's where the problem comes in. So you're not generating jobs and jobs in a nice corporate environment. You're just mushrooming up another problem. Yeah. So I'm not sure if anybody else yeah. has found that chair or... Yeah. Uh, Any comments or questions from the audience so far? I, yeah, great. I think there's a, a mic coming around, maybe? No. no. Okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I can, yeah. mm -hmm. I can actually answer that. I, I, I've worked at two places, okay. two huge places, or actually three, but SABC, where we had a lot of fronting, and I'll be honest, we had a lot of fronting for a very long time. You have the SABC, you have what you see on TV, you have what you hear on radio. Then you have prime media, where you have people in charge in certain positions. You won't survive a week there if you're not competent in that position. The people that, that I've told you about in those positions are fantastic. They're there because they're the strongest people. Mm. And very often, I'll say that our group editor-in-chief, Katie Katapotis, if she wasn't there, I think things would fall apart. So if you can get your company to that point of view, you're, you're aces. You're fine. Yeah. I think I'd also perhaps want to just respond to that because I think my sense is that it's a much deeper inquiry than just the fronting. And, and what we're experiencing uh, as women leaders in organizations is that, A, that we have been taught leader, leadership by, uh, within a primarily masculine value system. So, so without judging it, because as we've already established, it's very important and it's necessary because it's got us uh, you know, to d deliver and achieve and to build and to, uh, to make things happen in the world. But... Functioning from primarily a, a, a system of values that we are expected to be incongruent in. Because when we're in organizations, you're expected to function from a particular set of values. And when you're outside of the organization as women, you're expected to function from a different set of values. 
And somehow we don't seem to be able to connect these two mm-hmm. sets very easily. And a lot of the reason why women experience such a lot of difficulty in organizations is because it's not that we don't know how to be task oriented or we don't know how to be delivery oriented. It's that that's the only way we're expected to be. And if we function from another paradigm, that that's not respected as much as it's respected when men are yeah. performing those roles. So if a man performs a role where he's, he, ex, um, he expresses empathy or there's uh, collaboration and connectedness and emotional intelligence, he's actually valued much higher than if it's a woman expressing the same kind of values in an organization because she's expected. We're mm-hmm. expected to function like that. Mm-hmm. And when we drive and delivery oriented and execution mm-hmm. and make it happen, then we're Iron Maidens, right? That's yes, the yeah. languaging around it. Yeah. So that kind of front, it can, can be a very tricky thing for the woman and how we experience and express ourselves as leaders. Um, yeah. It's very challenging. And, and, and Arti, you, you were saying at Old Mutual how, how surprised you were yeah. at how many senior women. Again, do you want to reflect on yeah, that I mean, kind of comment? I definitely think, uh, just looking back on my experience, um, fronting is definitely prevalent, even in the private sector. Um, I think the the way that businesses, or at least the way I've seen them actually um, working through that, is actually, well, when it comes down to delivery and merit, that's when they start to have issues in terms of, you know, is the person the most uh, relevant person to be there, the most necessary? But then the issue comes into, as in terms of other labor policies or HR policies, is then how do you deal with that if somebody's non-performing? And you know how typically it is very, very difficult to actually remove people. Um, typically, they get moved around to different roles. Yeah. Um, and I have seen that as well. So it is an issue. Um, but I mean, just to touch on, on Vicinta's point about, you know, behavior styles and, and how that actually comes across. A lot of the time, the, the women that you actually do see that are, that are put out there are very masculine dominated in their approach Mm -hmm. and it's because they feel they have to be that way um the the nurturing caring sort of style that we typically know ourselves to be is seen as very soft Mm -hmm. um so almost that as you said it's very much you're putting that front up but it's not a truism of who you are and then that starts to actually play out Mm -hmm. in the organization Uh, questions thank you No, there is one coming if you'd like. Um, I suppose one of the important things for women is the whole concept of authenticity. Mm -hmm. I think what I'm finding is that as individuals, we are unique. We're born with a power to think and to be. And that means that there are some women who will be masculine. Mm -hmm. And part of it is that we must give them the liberty to to be be just that. But there are some women that are very soft-spoken, but who can drive delivery. delivery. And I think that we need to be able to create a climate that says what we need of you is for you to be the best that you can be. Mm -hmm. And to be able to say, let us lift the stumbling blocks that make sure that the playing fields are not even, but not try to create a genesis or a a type of woman in a certain mold that everybody must fit into. Mm -hmm. Because then we become the very thing that we were contrary to. Mm -hmm. So just allowing people to be themselves, I think, is important. Any any comments? Yes, (laughs) it's about that strength and diversity, isn't it? It's, Mm -hmm. um, and again, that that ability to take an organization to flex to the people that will be able to be unlocked if they are allowed to be themselves, Mm -hmm. rather than people needing to adjust themselves to accommodate Mm -hmm. the organization. Mm -hmm. But that takes a very nuanced leadership. And, yeah. and possibly also uh, addressing a little bit of, of your worry about the tokenism. I think it starts somewhere. You start putting people into places which used to be completely white male. And uh, even though they might not necessarily at the beginning be the right people for the job, I think time starts to take mm-hmm. care of that. It's just getting everybody used to that. Mm-hmm. What's sad for me was watching oh, goodness, Trump's Republican bunch (laughs) sitting around a table, all white men making decisions about women's health care. And in that moment, you suddenly realize how far we've come because that feels like the dark ages. And and so the dial is shifting, but it doesn't feel right for everybody in this moment. Great. Any other comments? Or I'm going to take another question. There's a, a mic coming, if you like. Yeah. I'd love to know... 
actually what you talk about when you talk about a feminine leader because in my mind surely task oriented or um, other aspects are more a personality than a, whether you're a male or a female. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I'd like to give yeah. that a go. Um, so a lot of the research points to, and I think we have to look at uh, leadership in a, in a historical, socio-cultural context. Leadership historically is, is associated with a masculine value system, historically. So we see that, that leaders that are valued are, are men, and the value system is of all the traits that we've described, drive, delivery, task orientation, etc. So what we've done historically in our cultures is we've ascribed leadership to masculinity and therefore men. And we have ascribed femininity or feminine behavior stereotypically. So you're right, it's not about, it's not the personality, it's what uh, gender stereotyping has done. And they said that it, we as women have to perform or behave in a particular way because we're women. That means we've got to be nurturing, we've got to be kind, polite, mm -hmm. collaborative, connected, mm -hmm. emotional, etc. The issue very much appears to be, and what the research indicates, is that what we're doing is we are, um, we are imposing our gender stereotypes, mm -hmm. beliefs, and expectations on each other as leaders. And therefore, unconsciously, if you function as a leader in a feminine value system, then somehow that equates to less power than if mm -hmm. you function from the mm -hmm. traits that we perceive as masculine. Mm. And so, yes, as, as what we're realizing, and, and certainly the leadership literature and discourse today, is very clear that both men and women possess the attributes yeah. that are necessary for the kind of leadership that is required today mm. if we want to thrive. Both have to have empathy. Both have to be able to drive. But, and certainly we do. But the broader cultural system that we yeah. are located in is what reinforces the stereotypes that we then judge each other from. I mean, th that's really interesting because uh, certainly in the UK, there's a lot of discussion about unconscious bias mm -hmm. and, and lots of organizations are introducing some kind of unconscious bias training to try and get people to, to walk away from those stereotypes when they are talking to an employee or hiring or thinking about who's right for promotion. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, it's a really challenging, deep-rooted thing, those unconscious bias. They are, they are unconscious, and it is something deep inside your brain. And have you got any interesting examples of how organizations have actually tried to tackle that? Because that that's, is so much at the root. Um, and in fact, on Radio 4 last night, there was a, a whole debate on, on unconscious bias and, and whether it even existed. And I, I'm absolutely firmly of the view it does exist. It is that cultural setting, mm -hmm. and there is something deeply rooted psychologically in our brains that we have to kind of move away from, consciously move away from. Any, any uh, examples? So I've, I've actually seen an, an example of trying to break that down, um, and it's within a coaching slash mentoring context. Um, I think they've coined the term um, reciprocal coaching in a way. So one of the organizations that I've worked for actually actively went out um, had identified high-performing female talent that would be promoted into a leadership role and actually asked them to coach their senior executives, which tended to be men. So that was very interesting because what they were trying to do was to show the, the, the male executives that, hey, you can actually be coached by a female in a very different kind of a way, mm -hmm. but you could also learn from what kind of probing and what kind of questions that they were asking. So I think the result of that, and I believe the, the company is still continuing with that at this point, was that a lot of the executives actually realized that there was a lot of things that they were missing that they hadn't thought of. So a lot of that feminine kind of view of leadership was starting to come forward. Mm -hmm. And they've actually, actually started to implement policies now taking into consideration some of these views that are coming across. So that was very, very interesting, I thought. Is it, is it not an age thing as well? And, and I say an age thing because I'll go back to my SABC example. 1993, and you had all these, these sort of old white guys. But as we've grown up and as we've got bigger, is society not changing to the point of view where if you walk in and your boss is a female, okay, well, okay, uh, you know, that's good. It's like normal day, really. Or are we still stuck with that whole 1993 mentality? I don't know. What do you, what do you guys think? 
Any? Yep. Anything else? Still stuck. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 So, so the comment was absolutely still stuck in, in your organization. What kind of uh, industry and organization you're in? Insurance. Yeah. No. Yeah. You don't mind me asking. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. It's not just important. Yeah. It's still very yeah. important. Yeah. And I think if you are a female leader, you, you see it more obviously because you're experiencing every day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is your company trying to change that though? Are they? I think everyone's trying to change it, but I think to the point that it's still run by males, yeah. and that's still the behaviour and what they expect. Yeah. It's not conscious because. Agreed. Agreed. I find men in general do not actually want to even go to the unconscious. Yeah. Because they benefit from it. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good point. I, I, okay, sorry, another comment. Okay, okay. Here and then over there. Yeah. Um, I think it's got to do with age and I think it's got to do with the industry. Mm -hmm. If you had to go into the mining industry and apply for a position as a financial manager, you would go in and, you, and, and a male counterpart would go in. Their perception would be, can she fit in? Not the fact that can she do the job properly. So I would ex be expected to know how to operate a forklift. All of those things, he wouldn't be expected to do that. We're going for a financial position, but it's about does she fit in with the entire structure or does she or is she capable? There's a big difference, mm -hmm. right? So you're never going to be able to get, get into and, and break those ceilings in those industries if the playing field is not yeah. fair and equal. And that's what I feel we need yeah. to get through to them. Agreed. If I'm applying for a position as a financial manager, I need to know finance. I, know, I need to know how to lead the business. I need to know how to present um, balance sheet statements, all of those things. I do not need to know how to operate a forklift. I don't want to. It was not what I applied for. Yeah. <laughs> but you expect it to do so because can she fit in? How do you break that yeah. ceiling? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, comment back here and then here. Oh, good. Perfect. <laughs> So uh, just to add on to that discussion, and then I want to ask Artie a question uh, yeah. about what she just said. Um, I'm in the consulting industry so in PwC, and often with women being in senior roles, the question is, who's our client? Mm -hmm. And if they're older men, are they going to react better to an older man making the presentation? Or mm -hmm. are they going to take a man more seriously? Are they going to you know, there's even the, the term that was coined in our team, the gray hair factor. And, and I guarantee that only applies to men because yeah. women don't go around with gray hair. <laughs> so there's definitely, <laughs> there's definitely that, that factor. And then Artie, I love what you just described. And actually some, uh, you know, group of women that, that are here with me today mm -hmm. from PwC were actually looking at putting in some sort of mentorship program. And yeah. the aspect that you described is something that we've talked about. Yeah. And we wondered how men would react to that, particularly yeah. older men. I mean, yes. we know from, you know from our environments that we've been in, men sometimes find it difficult to take feedback from women. And because there's that set way of thinking that a man's way is right, to put it bluntly, yes. um, often you know, younger women that are aspirational or want to get into mm -hmm. leadership positions will have input, but it's not necessarily taken seriously because it might be con not considered to be the right way of being. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious to know, in, in the example that you mm -hmm. described, yes. how did the men actually respond to that? And, and were they open to it? Was there any actual change, tangible change? Mm -hmm. So initially there was resistance. Um, well, I, And I think anyone who's approaching coaching actually is initially resistant <laughs> um, because they don't understand what, what it all entails. Uh, but certainly initially there was resistance, but once they actually got into that formal 
kind of process of coaching and then a bit of mentoring as well, um, they actually started to have a lot of questions. Um, and I remember speaking to the HR executive at the time, and she said she was just amazed by how quickly they actually started to reciprocate and take in some of the ideas that the that the coaches were actually putting forward to the to the executives. So it was almost as if you just needed to get over that little stumbling block, that little initial resistance, and just kind of push forward. And then they became very open to that. Artie, who was the sponsor? Because I think that's often critical. Because if it's not sponsored by somebody really senior in the organization, yeah. and it's something that comes up from the grassroots, yeah. It will get undermined. Yeah. No, this this was sponsored by the CEO of yeah. the business, so it did come from the top. Yeah. Who was a man? Who was a male? Yeah. <laughs> um, so it and that in itself was also surprising. I mean, we we always talking about masculine and feminine and people not recognizing. Mm. Um, but I mean, here was somebody who actually said, you know, I want to build up my female talent, but I want my male executives to also understand that there's differences and nuances in, in actually being able to do business. So he had read up about this and obviously through an international example and decided, hey, I want to implement this. HR, yeah. please, can you help me execute this? Yeah, that's I mean, I, and I think that's something that's hugely valuable is to share these kind of initiatives yeah. and think about how you can tweak them in your own organization. And I was sharing with Artie that we ran a similar session back in the UK and uh, Lease Plan, who are a big uh, organization who does fleet management uh, of cars, <laughs> therefore quite male dominated, their uh, board director decided they needed to do something to tackle unconscious bias and they launched the Women's Arctic Challenge. Now you think, what the heck is that all about? And, and what they decided to do is to say, okay, we're going to get the women in this organization the opportunity to participate in an Arctic expedition, and we're going to make it competitive, and we're going to select 12 women to cross Baffin Island with an explorer. And they had a huge number of women put up their hands saying, yeah, I want to have a go. They had a big boot camp to test their fitness, their mental strength. Would they be able to do it? Twelve women were, were chosen and did the challenge. And the impact about men's view of women generally in the organization flipped because all of a sudden they said, hang on, I never knew women would want to do something like this or be capable of. And it, it's not the kind of thing that I ever would have thought about as an idea for for tackling unconscious bias. So I think there are some really interesting, innovative initiatives that if you do some reading around, you can find in order to tackle it. Yeah. Any, any other examples? Um, I'll come back. Yeah. Just to, I, I just want to make a point, which is kind of sitting with me. I think connecting John's <laughs> earlier invitation around feminist leadership mm -hmm. and Lisa's point around feminine mm -hmm. behavior and traits. And I think somewhere in the in the our leadership way of being, we we uh, confuse the two, and and it's the in, it's the invitation of feminist leadership about transforming the landscape that is really what we need to engage with, mm -hmm. and really being deliberate about leaders and what we're wanting to shift in the culture mm -hmm. of our organisation versus creating this. Uh, uh, reinforcing the biases and the stereotyping of feminine mm -hmm. and masculine mm -hmm. leadership. It's really that integration yeah. that's necessary. I'm conscious we've got some other hands up. Yeah. Go, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to add a point on um, the sponsorship of um, the women advancements within the organizations. And I, I come from an organization that in the past um, 10 years has really um, tried to make efforts to make sure that uh, they promote women mm -hmm. into leadership positions. And um, that really happens if it's driven at leadership level. Mm -hmm. The CEO um, themselves are the ones that are doing that. Um, and in our case, we've had um, a stream of uh, CEOs that um, were men, uh, but also female CEOs. But um, it's also around the systems that you build uh, within the organization, you need to make sure that you create spaces for sharing um, how some of the women, what women are experiencing within the organization. Um, we've had uh, women development um, leadership programs that made sure that women within the organization, you have a pipeline that they could go up uh, to senior positions. 
we also have had um, women's forums mm -hmm. across um, the, the organization where you create spaces where women can share what are some of the challenges mm -hmm. that they face within the organization. And through those forums, we're able to actually have very clear examples where, men, where women are saying, we've got a boys club in the organizations. They're the ones that are making decisions mm -hmm. in this organization and you call what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and through saying it um, openly in those spaces, you give examples of what those behaviors around um, and men get to know exactly mm -hmm. what, um, what, what is wrong and what is right. Um, I'll give an example where um, in terms of maternity leave, We've had 10 years ago, um, men um, leaders in organization, when a woman um, is, is pregnant, they would have to maybe make feel uh, terrible that um, there's going to be um, money that is spent by replacing them um, because it's, 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 it's impacting the budget. And because you call that out and you make sure that you have policies that say uh, four months are going to be fully paid for women that are on maternity leave and you also call out those leaders. We found a shift in how men sometimes are engaging with women that are on maternity leave. Mm -hmm. So those are just some of the examples. Mm -hmm. But I think it needs to be driven um, up. And you also need to set goals as an organization. I know that um, sometimes it's a bit cheesy, but um, <laughs> you do need to make sure that you have to set goals. Yeah. We had set goals um, ourselves and said in 10 years' time, that was in 2005. We said uh, by 2015, we need to make sure that we have 50% women across, um, women representation across the organization, mm -hmm. and also 50% women uh, in senior leadership positions. Once you have those targets that, I've set, that have been set, not only within senior leadership, uh, but also in our governance structures, in our boards, and once that is channeled down to that level, mm -hmm. you also need to report um, on it yeah. regularly so that people are fully aware mm -hmm. um, of what the figures and how far mm -hmm. are you. We've never been, um, we were able to get the 50% across the organization in terms of female, uh, male representation, but you, you find that sometimes you, you get 47%, 46% in terms of women in senior leadership, uh, leadership positions. Mm -hmm. But the main thing is that if you are tracking it, you are able to explain where you are and how far you are, but that always yeah. challenges yeah. you. Yeah. You travel one step, um, a few steps forward, but a few steps backwards as well. Yeah, it's uh, there's some interesting best practice there, and if you wouldn't mind sharing the organization and the the field. Okay. Yeah, um, I work for an international NGO called Action Aid International. Right. We operate in 45 countries, and I'm um, the OD manager who's driving women leadership. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a really strong champion in the organization. There's, there's a, I think, another question, really interesting story, and then another one back there. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mansika. I just wanted to uh, uh, build on Artie's comment on coaching and give a plug for the Henley Postgraduate <laughs> Certificate of Coaching. We haven't because, paid her. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because, uh, because I've gone through it, uh, and I strongly believe that, uh, for me, it, it has changed my view uh, on how the... Uh, the sort of uh, preconceived biases come about and how you overcome it, mm -hmm. uh, both from uh, being perhaps the recipient of it, but also ourselves, how we bring uh, our own um, history and, uh, mm -hmm. and and biases to, to most interactions uh, mm -hmm. that we go into. Anyway, the, the MBA is great, the postgraduate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I just wanted to perhaps make uh, two points, uh, just building on, uh, on the previous uh, comment. Uh, the, the first is that I think that being a, demonstrating and having sponsors is great. Uh, and where organizations can uh, find the female leaders who will demonstrate it, it's important because it shows uh, the rest of the organizations uh, that the organization is... Uh, is committed uh, and, and confident of the direction. And secondly, we have to find, in a way, the business case uh, for yeah. the gender diversity. Uh, and I think there's a lot of research now that shows that organizations with enough diversity uh, and gender equality actually outperform. Yeah. Uh, a, a recent McKinsey study uh, uh, showed this. I believe Bain has uh, this mm. year's latest report. I haven't seen it, uh, mm. but, uh, but they've done uh, good work this year that shows, uh, that shows the same. So we, we, we get confirmation of this. 
Uh, having said that, we still almost need a little bit of regulation around it. Now, I'm a director of the JSC, and, uh, and people think that the board, because 45% of the JSC's board is female, think that we put up this regulation. We didn't. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the JSC has now made a requirement for listing that, um, that boards have to actually have a gender diversity strategy. Mm -hmm. So I know most of you will now be scratching your heads and going, well, how's my organization going to deliver this? Um, I've been a, a director of the JSC since 2014, so I know that it's possible. Because when, when boards are focused and committed to the direction that says, actually, mm -hmm. it's got nothing so much to do with the diversity, but with the performance of this organization <laughs> and the sustainability of this organization depends on it, then the change happens. Mm -hmm. We've seen the results, and we're now urging every single listed large organization mm -hmm. in South Africa to commit to their shareholders yeah. that this is what our strategy mm -hmm. is. And mm -hmm. I believe corporate South Africa is embracing it. Yeah. I mean, that's interesting because I think the Hampton Alexander Review similarly is asking government in the UK through the annual reports to, within the governance statements, to have that kind of commitment to what are they doing about gender diversity and also to have the data presented regularly. And, and interestingly, the other side of the coin is how do you get the major investors, the institutional investors, to hold the major corporates to account in a similar sort of way. So, you know, we all have our role here, mm -hmm. all kinds of different stakeholders in pushing that forward. Mm -hmm. Question Thanks. it. Hi there. Um, uh, talking about the, the glass ceiling issue. It's working. Yeah, yeah, it is. Right. Yeah. Uh, just with the glass ceiling issue, I find myself, uh, and, and I know colleagues of mine as well, putting the glass ceiling on ourselves. Okay. Where because as you go high and up in corporate, you actually the expectations become different. And what, what Jules was talking about, this thing of family disappears. Mm -hmm. You expect it to be giving all your time and it, it just looks weak if you want to be able to spend more time at home or you do not want to be spending long hours at work. So I just look into the panel in terms of how is that actually going to be addressed because I'm finding that females are actually holding themselves back from growing up. And, and our male counterparts are saying, we want to give you the positions, but you are actually saying no to them because of what it, what it requires. So just how has that yeah. actually been addressed uh, mm -hmm. by corporate? So, Ray. It's actually quite a, it's a, very, a very interesting question because we get that often as well. You'll have a working mom and a stay-at-home dad. So you had the old stereotypical example of dad went to work, mom stayed at home, cooked dinner, looked after the kids, but that, that whole role has now changed. Um, and I think maybe what companies need to do today is have a look at that giving more paternity leave, except for my friend who wanted to come home. Um, <laughs> that sort of thing, in that you have the role where things are changed. So for a woman to have a glass ceiling and saying, this is all I'm going to become, something I'd like to actually also talk about as well is training. What happens? We need our future leaders to start coming forward, to start coming up. So you have an idea about you're going to become a manager one day because you want to go into corporate. There is no glass ceiling for you. If you want to go up and up and up and up, that's great. Good. You might have a stay-at-home husband, but we need to change those rules because things have changed. This is not the early days anymore. This is now 2017, and life has changed. The whole scenario has changed. And I think that's what maybe if you're looking at the JSC and you're looking at models like, like that, you can actually change and say, let's incorporate that in as well. Let's come up with new structures. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. I was, I was just watching... Uh, a brief interview uh, Cheryl Sandberg was having with Ellen <laughs> DeGeneres the oh, other right. day about her new book. You know, she wrote the Lean In book. Yeah. And uh, that was a lot about how women should and shouldn't behave in the workplace and, and asking women to actually step up to the plate with those kinds of decisions. Interestingly, I mean, she's had that dreadful tragedy in her life of her husband dying. Mm -hmm. Still has this very senior role at Facebook with Mark Zuckerberg as her boss. And she's she's having a different nuance to her conversation. She's saying single moms can't just lean in. <laughs> That's one of the interesting challenges. And, and here she is now as a single mom raising grieving children. The fact that Mark Zuckerberg is really, really giving her the space to be able to cope with all of those um, complexities in the life that she's leading now and still give her the space to lead in that organization, talks a lot to the culture of that organization. And so I think 
um, the expectation of the demand that says if you're going to get the senior role, your life belongs to us completely. Yeah. Maybe that's becoming outdated, and maybe it's yeah. that that we should be yeah. pushing back on, yeah. rather than just saying, "How do we? How do I make my husband yeah. into a, a stay-at-home dad?" Yeah. Which happens in many mm-hmm. cases mm-hmm. in order to enable our family to achieve yeah. this, uh, the income that mm-hmm. could come from my promotion. Um, just from my side, so I, I think I'd probably answer that in a very typical coaching type of <laughs> manner, in that um, you actually answered the question yourself as you spoke in terms of it's being self-imposed. Um, and that's, I think, one of the biggest limiters for us as women is we do impose these biases of what we think the company wants or expects from us. Um, but the question is, why behave that way or why do that? Mm-hmm. And, and that's something that you kind of have to question as well. I mean, I, I remember in, in my career as well, um, um, a colleague of mine and I, we actually went up to... Uh, a, a new CEO had started in our business. And I said, hey, let's go and introduce ourselves. And she was terrified. She's like, oh, we can't just go to the CEO and say hello. I mean, that's just not done. <laughs> and I looked at her and I thought, no, I mean, it's just a person. Happens to have a title. Why can't you go and say hello? And we went and we did that. And to this day, that CEO, who's now moved on to another, says, I still remember the fact that you walked up to me and nobody else spoke to me. <laughs> and you came yeah. and you said hello. So... We impose these limitations on ourselves. Yes, having a culture in a company is enabling and can help you get there easier. But um, push the envelope. Mm. Be yourself. And there's also something to be said for the senior executive women who are already there Mm. pushing the envelope. Agreed. Because it's much easier to do it when you have the power. And so those of you who are those pioneering women who do sit in those places, Mm. it's, it's sometimes... I I did some very, very strange things in my (laughs) 20 years. One of them was um, breastfeed my son while I was presenting to to Nedbank about a 2 million rand deal I was trying to sell them. And that was because I needed to push the envelope. They wanted me to present at 7 o'clock at night and my son was six weeks old. And I said, that is the time that I feed my child. And I'm not going to leave a screaming child at home with his father. It's not fair to the child, whatever. Can we do it at a different time that can fit into my breastfeeding schedule? They said, we're sorry, it's the only slot. I said, fine, I'm bringing my child with me in the piccolo. He'll be asleep. But if he wakes up and I'm in the middle of the presentation, I'm telling you I'm going to feed him while I'm presenting. Will you be able to do live with that? Absolutely, Jules. <laughs> but, but it's because I don't... Because I was in a, in a position of power, because pushing yeah. the envelope means that once yeah. I have sensitized those people to something like that, they yeah. can take a lot more, a more because they've moved it. So we have to be brave. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think often women, that self-imposing, which is what will everybody else think if yeah. I walk out the door at 3 o'clock to pick up my son or to go in, into a sports day or a presentation? What does everybody else think? I don't really care. Mm. This is what I need to do. And the, and I know I'm going to meet my targets and I'm going to deliver the outcomes. And that's what should be important. And that's the real, that's the shift is, is not, it's that real personal worry we so often have about what everybody else thinks about us. And I think women more so than men fall into that trap. I've got two questions. So one here and then one over there. Yeah. Uh, thank you. We are pushing the envelope by, <laughs> by the way. And uh, it seems like the pushing of the envelope then becomes a problem to, 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 to the men up there because you then notice a change of behavior. But my point now was to say, I think there are fundamental problems that we never addressed in South Africa or we never thought of that they are going to emanate because we have a very supporting legislative. Now, women are promoted in the organizations, but there is no support in terms of empowering, you know, to say, now you are a leader. How do you actually position yourself in the boardroom? How do you argue your issues without being emotional in, 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 in the boardroom? The second one is that there are silent, very, very silent behaviors that we find ourselves entertaining, at, you know, as women. For example, the issue of sexual harassment in organizations. Companies, what they do, Number one, women are not sharing those sexual harassments in the organization. You find that people who are sitting in those cases are men. Mm. And what do you expect to be the outcome of that? Mm. It will never be an outcome that supports the women that has gone through that trauma 
of being sexual abused in the workplace. Mm. What happens? They shift the culprit to another area. And surprisingly, so to myself, we used to say, the women in that era are actually accommodating that man. Mm. So I, I know I asked one time in, in my organization to say, if we're saying this guy must be shifted, why do you expect me to say to the women that are in my team? They are going to be traumatized. The first day I introduce him to say, hey, this team now we are going to be joined <laughs> by Mr. So and so. You know, because now they don't even know how to behave in the yeah. presence of, of, yeah, of, yeah. of, of this particular guy. Yeah. So I, I, I'm just saying there are fundamental issues that I think they have made a shift after so much work that has been done in this country in terms of the legislation. Yeah. The, sec the third one for me, it's ourselves as women. You know, usually most of the organization, it becomes a secret to say, what is the target that needs to be achieved? You know, on women, it becomes a, a secret. And sometimes we send out adverts to say, this particular position is for women. But you get into a panel where we are looking for a female candidate, and it's men. Mm. <laughs> There's no woman yeah, that's yeah. sitting in, in, in that particular panel. Mm -hmm. I know I've taken some decisions to say, I'm not approving this panel. And they're like, yeah, yeah. oh, no, but uh, it's me who's hiring. But I'm saying, I'm not approving your yeah. panel. Yeah. You are looking for a woman, yeah. but all your panel members yeah. are males. So these are silent, chauvinistic, mechanism or systematical yeah. things that we actually, yeah. you know, condone ourselves unconsciously so mm -hmm. as women. So the issue is still there. We really appreciate the legislation, but also probably the discussion must shift from the issue of talking of numbers. I think we're very clear now as women to say, we don't want to be numbers. We just want yeah. to be appointed based on our competencies. We are not going to be apologetic on those ones. No. Thank you. No. <laughs> Uh, lots of, of lots. issues there. <laughs> I'm going I'm to start with the first one, which is the supporting women who move up the chain and find themselves in potentially quite a lonely place mm -hmm. of, you know, joining a, a board or a committee or a, a, a group where you're one. And I think all the research would say, until there's three of you, you really are lonely. And, and how are organizations tackling that, both in terms of leadership support because maybe it's a gauntlet for us at Henley here about how we should be helping support that agenda. Mm -hmm. But but what are organizations doing at the moment? Isn't that you're, you're doing that kind of work? Mm -hmm. I am doing a lot of that kind of work. My sense right now is that it's not a deliberate, there is no deliberate support. There is no deliberate support. Coaching and mentoring is a, a primary way within which to garner and generate and strengthen women leaders. Mm -hmm. But, of course, we're still sitting in a situation where globally the percentage is 20% of leaders in senior roles are women. And, therefore, most of the leaders available for mentoring are men. And the masculine value system permeates that mm -hmm. conversation. So that's the one context that, we, that we're dealing with in, in that and that we need to change. Another thing that we find, of course, is that, you know, somebody mentioned the old boys club. And they... Uh, the boardroom, the golf, golf days, the boss barrage, you know, yeah. those are the language in that men have rituals. Leadership, historically, uh, they have rituals around leadership, whereas women, we have not yet integrated. And again, we must be very careful because we don't want to create this kind of separation mm -hmm. of men and women. And that's a very important part of how we need to uh, engage with the conversation around leadership. But my experience of working with groups of women leaders is that we don't know how to get together around strengthening ourselves as leaders. Yeah. And who are we? We mentioned authenticity. That has come up so much in conversations around this is who I am. And I think the points that you've made are very, very important for highlighting the, what's happening in the system. We are still dealing with all of yeah. those things. And it's not the fact that we, we have... Uh, we have uh, initiatives in place, that we, we have targets in place, that we have goals that we've identified, does not mean we're no. necessarily addressing yeah. the cultural elements yeah. that need to shift yeah. in order that behavior changes and therefore manifests yeah. in a different statistic, yeah. which yeah. is where we really need to get yeah. to. Mm -hmm. So some of the things that we're doing yeah. around it is, A, is working with groups of women leaders to say, what does this look like? What do, does it need to look like? And how do we engage in a conversation yeah. that brings us into partnership mm -hmm. if we think about 
the broader landscape where, where feminine qualities have been undermined mm-hmm. and masculine qualities have been over-elevated mm-hmm. in a leadership context is a gap. Yeah. And before we can talk about partnership, we have to understand how this, what happens in this space. Mm-hmm. And then when we're sitting here, we can talk about how do we integrate? Mm-hmm. What does it mean to be partners, partners? in leadership. So a lot of the conversation that we I have in a group coaching, organizational development, leadership context is what does that partnership look like? And I, I don't want to talk too much, but I say two of the tools that we need to be very, very, very aware of and conscious around, or make it three. One, how do we convene? What are the conversations, like Timbisa invited us to think about, What are the conversations and the quality of the conversations that we're having and how prepared are we to be courageous and open and honest and direct about Mm -hmm. that and to hold each other in that space, right? It's not about being attacking. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's not about men and women. It's about who are we as leaders for the greater good. The thing that Jules mentioned earlier around language, you know, we've got to be very, very conscious about the language we use. Mm -hmm. Uh, Janet and I were talking earlier and I was sharing that some of the uh, management development programs that I've been involved in over the last few weeks is the language in it is about chicks. And, you know, who's that chick? <laughs> like, what's she doing? And that, we don't speak like that about men no. in the system. Yeah. <laughs> we speak about the, the iron maid and the bitch. Yeah, the, you know, exactly. we speak with the languaging around women yeah. and the women leaders. Is a, we, and we have to become conscious about that because we, we know in, a, in our world of... of um, Certainly what neuroscience is telling us, you know, elevation, strength-based appreciation changes the way we perceive things. Mm -hmm. And the third tool is imagery, is we've got to begin to change the imagery. If you Google leadership right now, look at what comes up. If you you look at what kind of imagery we use in our organizations that give us a picture of what leadership is about, it's very male, very sporty military, war, competition, crush yeah. the, you know, enemy, blah, blah. That's language is one part yeah. of yeah. what we are as leaders. Yeah. I sat in such an interesting um, conversation last week. We are at the Shared Value Summit, which is an incredible thing. Um, those of you who didn't go this year, go next year. It's an extraordinary conversation. But, but one of the very unfortunate pieces of it, some incredible speakers thinking and, and talking about it, were called onto a panel. And as they walked onto the stage, we realized that we were looking at a completely white male oh. panel. Um, clever, clever guys. But what was so interesting was watching the conversation shift. The, the, the testosterone on the stage, you know, people start egging each other on. There's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And you can just feel the, the one-up mission, one-manship happening a little bit. And then one of the, the executives sitting there was just saying, you know, CEOs just have to put their balls on the boardroom table about that. <laughs> and there was this recoiling of, of us all in the audience because that language yeah. is, we recognize it yeah. and it's not appropriate in our world anymore. No. Um, and how extraordinary. And I know I've been the one to, that talked about me as being the steel balls girl for years. <laughs> and I was proud of that title. And I'm suddenly thinking, no, no, no our yeah. language really has to yeah. change. And it, it's interesting. It's the power of the group. Mm. And, and, you know, at, at Henley, I was really quite reluctant to start yet another women's group. You think, gosh, but actually it's together that we have the power to call out on, on those kind of behaviors or the bad language or just mm. say, do you realize you keep choosing these kind of images that go on the walls of our, our mm-hmm. or, you know, the, the, old, the old pictures through the history of the organization? What are they normally? White men who over the years have run this organization, what does that say to anyone who walks in the door? So what are the images? Where's the youth? Where's the the just whatever diversity? But people don't even know they're doing it. So it has to be called out. But calling it out on your own, you're very vulnerable. Calling it out as a group, it's much more possible. Now, I've got, a, I've got another question here, and I'm, gonna, I'm conscious we're going to run out of time if we're not careful. We're here, and then there, and then there. Okay, so one, two, three. Okay. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? <laughs> um, I have two comments, sort of. Um, the one is around um, the challenge of us needing to be more like men, or um, uh, uh, someone mentioned earlier about us not being emotional. But in a boardroom or in a meeting, 
when I'm emotional or if I show passion, I'm being emotional. If a man shows passion, he's passionate. I think it's, it's, it's about us understanding that I'm allowed to be who I am mm -hmm. um, and allowed to express myself. Yes, there are certain barriers that you shouldn't cross, both mm -hmm. for male uh, and female, but it shouldn't be seen as me being emotional if I'm passionate about a cer certain topic or a certain project or a certain direction that mm -hmm. I feel the organization or the department should be going. Um, my second comment is around a slightly controversial one in a room full of women, <laughs> but how we as women pull each other down and don't lift each other up. Yeah. We have a bias ourselves towards a woman leader. We have a bias ourselves towards um, having women um, guide us, lead us, and when they do something wrong, oh, it's because she's a female. Mm -hmm. um, and we ourselves are the ones actually um, perpetuating that, mm -hmm. that bias and that um, stereotype. And yes, men play their role, but we also play that role. So we ourselves also need to change our mindset and yeah. shift how we think and how we see ourselves and how we see other women. Really good points. Mm -hmm. Any comments? Yeah, I mean, I can reflect on the second point, um, you know, just thinking about the number of, of bosses or seniors that I've had. Um, I can probably count eight of them, six of them men, two of them women. And interestingly, I mean, just to also touch on sponsorship, Four of them sponsored me to help me get further in my organization and my career, but all four were men. It was none of the women, which was very interesting. So it, it kind of ties into your mm -hmm. point as, as to why is that the case? Is mm -hmm. there issues of um, feeling threatened, insecure? Mm -hmm. um, why not help elevate if you're already at that position? So it is, yeah. it is something very prevalent. Yeah. It's actually so sad because one of the things that I've learned is the art of leadership is taking diversity that's in front of you. You, whether you're the CEO, the CFO, whatever you are, you will, the art of leadership is you, you listen to all those around you. Mm -hmm. And if somebody comes up with a great idea, you've got a great idea. You go with that person's idea. You put your ego somewhere else, you go with that person's idea because it's the, the final product. So when hearing you and saying, put yourself down, then I think your leaders need to be replaced because they're not <laughs> doing the job properly. Yeah. 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 Any other comments? No. So, um, and, and just maybe on the emotional side, yeah. I mean, I, I oh, right. actually did want to touch on that. Um, it, I think it is actually fine for you to be emotive in, in, a, in a meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what we do very well as females, it's in, in, inherent in, that, in us, is that we are emotionally intelligent. So we do know when you yeah. can dial it up and when you can dial it down. But yeah. because we feel as if you can't do it, you tend not to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's actually yeah. being detrimental to you, yeah. being putting yourself out there. Yeah. Uh, a very quick comment on that, um, because it is actually quite a big question. Yes. Uh, and a big, yeah. <laughs> there is a term that, it's, I think it's called the queen bee phenomenon, is yeah. the term associated yeah. with the, that <laughs> phenomenon. And, and it's just maybe for us to be a, uh, to be a little bit gentle on our sisters, <laughs> to be aware of the many facets of that, very, that one point. One, from a psychological theory point of view, human beings emulate the behaviors in their in-group yeah. in order to fit in. And so we, because of social identity, we want to fit in. And so we are emulating the behaviors unconsciously of men, primarily, because mm -hmm. they're our peers in a leadership context currently. That's the one thing. So unconsciously, that's the one thing that we'll do. The second thing is that we have been socialized to value masculine behavior above feminine in a leadership context. So like you said, what we'll do is we'll look at women, and even if they behave from the, from the same uh, the, uh, passion or whatever it is, we'll judge them differently mm. because our own bias is that. Yeah. And, and it's a very precarious position women are in because we're trying to fit in and be good leaders in a context that we don't quite fit in yet. Uh, and we're trying to shift the system yeah. and, be, and we judge very, yeah. very harshly for it. Yeah. So we're in very... It's yeah. a tricky place to find ourselves in. And I think that's the marathon rather than the sprint, right. to bring these two things together. Mm -hmm. I've got a, here, and then I've got one at the back, and then I've come back here. <laughs> so I've got one back here, but patient she's been. <laughs> I think that um, we've started touching on, uh, basically touching on family structures. And um, I'm going to speak from a particularly heteronormative uh, viewpoint in a particularly heteronormative society. Um, but I think that I know many women who've done incredibly well in a corporate environment, and yet what's not challenged is they go home at night to particularly stereotypical relationships. Yeah. And I think that 
if we're going to start challenging what's happening at a corporate level and in our greater society, it has to happen on many levels. Mm -hmm. And it starts with your own advocacy within your personal relationships. Is, you know, to, if we want to challenge that unconscious bias, what are we doing in our own homes? Mm -hmm. How equal are our relationships? Are you, as a woman, expected to be the one who organizes the school lifts, uh, makes sure the Woolworths shopping is done or the pick and pay shopping or whatever after your incredibly busy day? Or is that a role that is very equally and comfortably shared um, by your spouse? And one of the areas of work that I work in is divorce mediation. And I sat with a couple last night, a young couple who are separating out their lives together. Um, their relationship hasn't worked. And um, they've got a young 18-month-old. And uh, the... The 18-month-old is staying predominantly with his primary caregiver, which has been stereotypically the mother. And uh, the father has a, a big job, and she also has a large job. And as we were trying to work out an interim um, kind of contact arrangement between them, he said, I, you know, I, I can come one night a week and do bath and bedtime, and then I can see him on a Saturday. And then he almost burst into tears, and he said, I'm not seeing enough of him. I'm missing him so much. And I said, well, how about another night that you do bath and bedtime? And he said, yeah, but my job requires me often to have meetings from 5 until 7 in the evening. And I said, well, I challenge you to perhaps put in that boundary just for two nights a week where you say, this is non-negotiable. This is my child, and I need to get mm -hmm. to see him. And he looked at me as though I'd co-written the Fibonacci code. Or <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then he stopped, and he said, I'm going to do that. And I think as advocates, the invitation is both for yeah. men and women to be yeah. able to, to challenge that, um, those biases, those entrenched biases, um, both in their personal lives, Agreed. in the corporate environment, wherever there's a chance for advocacy. Mm -hmm. It's not just the role of women. This yeah. needs to, the, the, the role needs to be taken up by men as well yeah. because they're missing out mm. um, no. on right. those family structures. Yeah, those family no. really great point. Yeah. Any observations or let's 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 keep going so that I, we can get a few more that's a really really important point and i think we do we're a bit schizophrenic sometimes um and want want it both ways and, and not challenging enough in our home environment there was one back here somewhere i think first okay no that back here yeah and then one here and then you're on yeah and um, then it goes down the line yeah. I'm, I'm i'm looking around this room and i'm thinking wow here we are discussing such important issues that affect us in, the, in organizations and corporate. And most of us and I, in fact, women, mm -hmm. and the boys aren't even here. It's a few. It's just a few. <laughs> it's a very few. Mm. To just hear us and, and, and understand Agreed. where we are coming from. The days where we are stereotypically playing with Barbie dolls have come and gone, and we are now going into those territories where they used to play with cars. We also want to play with cars. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking in my mind that perhaps maybe the integration part is, is that we want to be part of you. We don't want to be men. We don't want to be males in the organization as women. All we want to be is be part of the organization just as much as they are, and perhaps maybe make similar decisions that they make and be capable of making them. And the fact that we're wired differently doesn't necessarily mean that we are not competent. Mm -hmm. It only means that we come in a, in a supportive role that we play, that they actually need. Because there's so much that we look at that they perhaps do not see as part of the organization themselves. So the fact that they can make errors, and we also can make mistakes, but we get bashed more because we are the emotive type, we are the weaker. <laughs> We are the weaker part of the of the organization. Doesn't necessarily mean that we don't play an integral part. Mm -hmm. So perhaps maybe the boys and the girls need to merge and play together. <laughs> <laughs> if we wanna play with cars, it is okay for you guys to give us the cars to play with. If you want to play with my Barbie doll, come and play with it. And perhaps you will understand then how I'm wired and how I would react to certain decisions that are being made in the organization. And when I say no. It is not because I'm trying to be emotional and trying to throw tantrums around. It is merely because I also have that certain, a certain knowledge about an organization just as much as they do. So perhaps maybe the, the first point of, 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 of departure should be integration. Let's look at each other as equal. Mm -hmm. 
not because you are a man and I'm a woman, mm. and there is this diversity and gender equality on the table issue. Mm. No, <coughs> only because we are equal. We are equal, regardless of whether I'm a man mm. or a woman. I think you drive home a very good point. Next time we have a breakfast or business breakfast like this, we'll uh, get the partners to come as well. Because yeah. it yeah. is good. It's, it's good to learn for people to learn from each other because society has changed. The world has changed. But it's changed for the better. And you're quite right. It's good to have your partner here so that people can – and managers yeah. and CEOs and we need to have a part two. <laughs> now, and, and, and so when I run events like this back in the U.K., um, that they're ticket oriented and we do not quite buy one, get one free, but it's, it's bring somebody of the other sex along because I think you're so right. And I quite like to hear from one of the men in the room about whether this is a kind of conversation they've heard before and whether you, whether it's made you a potentially a wee bit more aware. I'll let, I'm not going to pinpoint you yet. <laughs> you can put up your hand in due course, <laughs> but it'd be really interesting to hear whether, you're, you're hearing things that you just, though you were kind of semi-conscious of, you, you didn't realize quite how deep-rooted it, it, it is. And I think it absolutely is deep-rooted. Yeah. That was actually exactly my point. Um, because I think as women, we also expect men to read our minds. And if we're going to drive the balance, then we need to also drive the conversational balance because we only learn from conversation. So what is your perspective, what is my perspective, and then try to find that middle ground, mm -hmm. which I think if we can do like a part two series, that would be excellent, because mm -hmm. I'd love to know what the men think of this um, conversation in terms of they've got their own perspectives, and mm -hmm. we just, it seems like a one-sided, um, we're driving it as women from one side, you know, mm -hmm. so it would be really great to mm -hmm. get both sides yeah. in the room and just bring the conversation to the yeah. table, you know, in terms of, yeah. and then driving it in organizations yeah. like that, yeah. to drive the balance. I mean, I'd just be interested from the panel, to what extent are these kind of conversations actually happening in organizations? You know, how much awareness is, is there? Because, you know, you talk about running the women's program or, you know, it's a one-to-one -one conversation with your sponsor, mm -hmm. but there has to be the bigger dialogue. <laughs> Again, <laughs> the silence <laughs> says it all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there is a, uh, my experience is that there is a move toward it. Yeah. There is a move toward it. There is a consciousness yeah. that is beginning to develop that we yeah. are genuinely becoming aware this is something that is necessary because the research is pointing to diversity, inclusivity, yeah. uh, et cetera, is necessary for effectiveness, innovation, mm -hmm. creativity if we're going to thrive as organizations. That's yeah. the narrative right now, right? So we're having to understand how to connect with that. But the broader cultural system that we're located within still undervalues mm -hmm. women as leaders in the broader sense. Yeah. And therefore that influences, mm -hmm. often deterministically, how those conversa mm -hmm. conversations happen in organizations. And so we find that 90% or 98% yeah. of women. So it's beginning to shift, but we're in the marathon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think there were some other questions in here, were there? No? Yep, great. There's a, here's a, a mic. I'm thinking here, and I'm listening. I'm thinking shame on how some uh, white old men, the way that we really like bashed them and said that, but I know that in my career when I was, go, I was coming up and it was the time when black men had arrived and they were leading. And I had uh, one of the issues that I like not to get the answer from here is how do we build a pipeline of women coming up because mostly now we've got black men in leadership roles mm -hmm. who when they see a black woman mm -hmm. who doesn't even comb their hair they can't even talk to because they think <laughs> you're too young or you're yeah, yeah. not matured or whatever they are more open to older black women mm -hmm. and then that really closes up you know when you're young and you're really feeling that you're ready and you can engage in all of that. So I really would want us to close this up with those things that how do we actually build up a mm -hmm. pipeline of women or maybe even young women mm -hmm. to non-executive roles? Yeah. No, I think mm -hmm. that whole pipeline issue is really interesting. Yeah. Comment? Look, I think from my side, um, what you're saying is definitely prevalent. Um, so in terms of building up that pipeline, it is happening, but very slowly. 
Um, I mean, I think we've, we've all kind of mentioned that the structures that are in place are insufficient to mm. actually mm. help us get there. Um, so it is part of that marathon. Um, how do we actually get it over the line? I mean, a lot of companies, including mine, transformation is probably the number one issue, um, whether it's at board level, whether it's all through the ranks. So it's being discussed. The implementation is slower than what we would expect, unfortunately. Um, it really is a, I think it really is a driving force when somebody who is in a particular position who has been identified as, as high talent or is actually very, very talented starts actually to upwardly push from where, wherever you are. Mm-hmm. And I found that that's been quite effective for me personally, mm-hmm. where, you know, I mean, I'm seen as one of the youngest people in my organization. So you do have those barriers about age and, you know, whether you're capable because you're so young. But I actually upwardly push um, my managers and their managers to actually see where the capabilities lie. And when you bring that visibility to the organization, because mm-hmm. they are very much unaware navigating yeah. this path, um, that's when you start to trigger change. And it does, like I said, it is slow. It's not going to happen overnight, mm-hmm. but it can happen. Take o- that initiative. Also, are people getting to know each other? That's it. We can have, I hear transformation, and I hear mm-hmm. laws, and, but are people getting to know each other? Because once you get to know each other, you get to speak to, like you did your CEO. Mm-hmm. We've got a great CEO, Omar mm-hmm. Isaac. And what, what Omar has done, he's had town hall meetings mm-hmm. where people get to come and meet each other and meet him. And he'll get sales to go meet news, and news go meet marketing, and yeah. he'll mix it all up. So eventually, it's not a case of this is your CEO, this is your manager. You get to know them, and that's just business. That's mm. all it is. That's right. mm. yeah. yeah, but there was a comment about at, at some point about women not actually talking about what their capabilities are, mm. and and assuming men are reading their minds yeah. about what you cannot do, and and therefore actually, as Autry said, that actually. Going up and saying, "Yeah, I've just done this, and I've delivered that, and you know, I've met that target, and I've got these skills." We kind of sit back and go, "Well, they must see it. Yeah, I've, I've it. delivered it. Yeah. Why wouldn't they know I've yeah. done all this?" Yeah. And they 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 just don't. Whereas men will walk in and and go, "I've just landed a great deal, yeah. and yeah, I've done this, and I've done, and they've yeah. actually it's a whole bunch of people behind them that have really helped them yeah. do it, but they will claim credit." So, yeah. you know, there's, there's a whole way we have to think about how do we position ourselves as women yeah. so that people who come from a different frame of mind actually see what we have to offer and what our skills and capabilities are. Yeah. Um, I've got they, another issue to raise. The yeah. In, the, inter, the intragender issue. Mm-hmm. Um, as women, we are not homogeneous. No. Um, being mm-hmm. heterogeneous is important to understand because uh, hearing from an age perspective to say that women of different age groups think differently mm-hmm. and they need their needs are different. And for us to start understanding ourselves as women, we first need to understand that inter-age and inter-gender mm-hmm. are a specific issue for women. I, I might come to work without combing my hair. That's fashion for mm-hmm. another age group. <laughs> For another, it will be what the hell, you know. <laughs> so I'm just also saying we need to have such conversations as women to say, okay, what are the needs of the young upcoming? For example, we spoke about pipeline. What are their needs, and what is it that we can do? You know, quick wins for them mm-hmm. when they arrive. For example, so those are the things that I'm I'm beginning to see in my organization. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, it's interesting because I think it's somebody was talking about male and female. There's a whole other debate in the literature about introverts and extroverts mm, yeah. and how introverts have been really put aside because they're not pushing themselves forward. So it's all these diversities mm-hmm. which actually bring interest to the group. And it's, it's learning how, from a leadership position, how do you call on and draw in all those different kind of individuals who've got all kinds of things hidden away, but you have to make space for them to have their voice. Um, and, and, you know, the, the young leaders of the future. And there's a lot of debate about millennials and what mil- millennials are after and what motivates them and so on. And I think as, as senior women leaders, it's, it's up to us to actually start to, to get a, a, an understanding of those, those mm-hmm. differences, whether it's, it's introverts, extroverts, whether it's age or whatever else it might be. So that's a really good point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One, of, one of the concepts that I'm starting to hear of is, um, I mean, typically when, when somebody's exiting the organization, you talk about an exit interview. Mm-hmm. What went wrong? What happened? Why yeah. are you leaving? 
But more and more now, they're starting to talk about stay interviews. So that is where somebody joins the organization and you actually ask them up front, so what will, make, what will keep you here for the long term? How can we retain you? What are some of the themes? Why are you joining us? And then continuing to have more consistent conversations with them, whether that's driven by HR or a sponsor or whatever. But I mean, I think that sounds really nice. I haven't yeah. seen it yet in practice. No, I... But I mean, to be able to then have that conversation, to then identify what those levers are yeah. and actually as an organization pull that way to, to make it, to build up that pipeline, to retain female talent, to see what their needs are. I think that could be very, very relevant. Yeah. No, I like that. Jules. Yes, and, and to support that, I think it's also about getting really creative about how you retain that talent. I mean, how many women in their 30s who have reached a very senior role already in their careers then start having their children, and because they can't actually stay 100% in the workplace because of their work, they have to leave completely. Mm -hmm. And there are all sorts of wonderful innovations out there. Mm -hmm. Job sharing, for example, mm -hmm. where you can get half the woman. She gets to be there some of the time, keep her brain engaged, still give her family value. And then her re-engagement back into the organization and her loyalty post that is worth much more than its weight in gold, mm -hmm. in fact. How do we engage women from an alumni perspective that you do yeah. go away for a while and then come back in here and still find the respect and the support that you would need to be able to grow yourself in the second phase of your career. Mm -hmm. So I think pushing the boundaries in terms of innovation around how we engage people based on what they might want or need is, is an important conversation to keep yeah. having. Agreed. Uh, the, I wanted to just offer to maybe bring our respect of men <laughs> into the space. Mm. The valuing of, I think many of us are aware of uh, Peter Sengli's uh, work and the learning organization. And it's coming up for me quite strongly. I think, you know, he was so ahead of his time in terms of, of framework for, for strengthening uh, organizations. And he talks, and, and it's very, I think, uh, apt for us today, talking about his key, five key um, elements of, an, of a learning organization. We need personal mastery. Who am I? How do I? Etc. We all, I'm not going to explain each one, but the sense of personal mastery at many levels as women, as, as uh, cultural people, as skilled professionals, as men, as whatever those different nuances are, what does that look like? He talks about team learning, and there's a huge amount of, of information at the moment around how do we strengthen that capacity for us to learn together? Mm. Because in those conversations, we then highlight, we get to know each other, we understand each other more, we understand contextually, because we cannot separate the environment, cultural context from our learning experience. And when we can bring them together in community, we strengthen our organizations and we strengthen ourselves. Mm -hmm. His other element of working in a systemic way, that's part of our old school is to cut everything up and to create silos, is that the only way for us to, to elevate this conversation into a shared vision, which is his other component, mm -hmm. is that we begin to work with the system. Mm -hmm. And the system is not just <laughs> you know, the, these walls and 20 stories. The system is the system that we exist yeah. within. Um, and there's another one which I'm forgetting right now, but I'm sure you remember. But looking at those elements holistically mm. is that they, it talks to how do we combine these mm. aspects of all of us into effective organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. really helpful. Mm. Any final question? Because I'm just conscious. I'm, I'm just, I'm going to warn my, my panel. I want you each just to give a, a sound bite of the one takeaway that you'd give the audience from our conversation. So I'll give you a time to think while we search for the a final conversation or, or question. Yep, here. Um, I'm listening to this very insightful conversation and I, I can not help but think that I remember sitting in some global conference <laughs> a couple of years ago and hearing very similar things. Mm -hmm. And if you look at South Africa specifically, 20 years, same conversation. Mm -hmm. You look at the JSE, you look at directors, whether it is black or it's women, and you look, and in reality, we haven't made the progress that one would expect. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because unless we understand the why, We'll probably be here another 10 years, 
another 20 years mm -hmm. and same beautiful conversation. So I'm really interested <laughs> in the why. Why have we struggled globally to move in the way that we have? Nice, simple question for the end. Anybody, anyone want to have a go? <laughs> Very high level. The, the, the research indicates that we are still located within a broader social cultural system that reinforces the stereotype. Mm. And until we begin to change that at multiple mm. levels, multiple mm. layers, therefore it is the marathon. Mm. Uh, we have internalized as women ways of leading that value, value system mm. that is not necessarily inclusive of all the traits mm. that we could embody as leaders. We educate, you know, I asked my 13-year-old niece recently, what is, she's in a private school, girls only, amazing education. What is the one thing that you would change about how you get educated? She said, I wish they wouldn't try to tell me how to be so perfect all the time. Yeah. She's 13 yeah. years old. Oh. <laughs> so our education yeah, is agreed. reinforcing it. In mm. families, our, our colleague over here mentioned mm. what's happening. In, mm. So it's a much bigger, so yes, you're yeah. absolutely right. If we don't begin to change it systemically. Agreed. Uh, we will have this conversation yeah. in another day. Yeah. <laughs> because we live in a different world. We, we really do. I, I saw a post this morning saying, I'm going off to write my exam this morning, but please, mom, realize that I may be an engineer, I may be a teacher, I may be whatever, but I may not be a mathematician. And I think that's exactly that. The world is changing. Mm. Yeah. We need to change with it. And yeah, yeah. Uh, I hear what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, I guess uh, I think this is the systemic is really interesting as we were having a conversation yesterday about um, a colleague here whose daughter is 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 determined to be a doctor. And then we were saying, but why not an engineer? Or why not? You know, and, and people get pigeonholed very early and women get pigeonholed about what you can and cannot be when you, quote, grow up. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I think there's also the generational issue, which is I certainly had a mother who didn't work and who stayed at home, and a father who was the breadwinner. And so I'm now changing the whole dynamic in my family, and, and both my husband and I worked, and, and therefore my daughter is, is out working in a professional capacity because she has had a role model in her family life that has helped drive that. So it, it is, I think there is, it takes generations to move some of these issues forward. Last comment. <laughs> Um, earlier on, someone made a comment about um, not hearing males' voices in terms of the conversation that is happening here this morning. Mm -hmm. My question really is, is there a piece of work that is being done, research, to find out from men what are the things that are standing in the way of women progressing beyond that mm -hmm. place? No? Uh, a study was conducted in, uh, as far as I'm, I'm sure there are many more, a study was conducted mm -hmm. in 2010 in South Africa, uh, and what it pointed to is the pervasive belief that men possess the attributes of mm -hmm. leadership more than women. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is actually uh, representative of, of a global phenomenon, mm -hmm. and it's called the think manager, think male phenomenon, mm -hmm. actually has men. So again, it just brought, it points to the broader the broadest uh, cultural system yeah. that we're in is that that, uh, that belief system is so deeply engendered that mm -hmm. to be a leader and to be a manager means mm -hmm. to be a male. And, and I think, uh, back to my comment, which is I also have a son, and therefore what kind of role model have I been to him? Because I think that's hugely important. That And he's an engineer and he works for Rolls-Royce, so it's completely male-dominated. But I don't think to have any qualms about having a a woman manager, because he's uh, he sees me <laughs> as a man, a mum manager, if you see what I mean. So I think our I think we have a responsibility as senior women leaders to make sure that we're role modeling back to not just our daughters but our sons or our nieces and our nephews. That that's hugely important. Uh, I'm very conscious of the time, and I'm just going to ask each of my panelists to give me a, a sound bite on what they would say a takeaway from this morning. Shania, just see how Dean has a question. He's been having he's his hand up. Yeah, he's last one. Oh. <laughs> All right. As John. always, John has to have the last word. <laughs> Not quite, John. You were, um, you, were, 
You're asking for men's voices. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, <laughs> and it was conspicuous how silent the men were. And I just wanted to make a, a comment, not a, not a last word, I'm sorry, but a comment that, that how curious that is. And I wonder how difficult it is for men to mm. find themselves to speak in this environment and how fearful that may be for men. Agreed. And that's a really interesting, for me, it's a really interesting thing to pursue why it is. I mean, I'm curious. I don't feel a man as a collective of men. I mean, I've, I've never been very clubbish like that. I see men as very varied and diverse. Some I want to spend time with. Some types I don't want to spend time with. <laughs> you know, it just depends. So it's, it's curious. I would just like to think that perhaps as we go forward, it would be very interesting to create a forum where you, we can get those comments coming out in, in, in this sort of atmosphere, which is so productive. Yeah, Thank you. very helpful, John. We'll, we'll come back to my last words. Jules, do you want to start? <laughs> yes, I think I'm just so wonderfully inspired by the nuance and quality of the conversation we've been having here today. And I've been talking about these kinds of things for 25 years. And my very first job, I actually, it was as a school teacher. And the law said that we women were paid less than men with our exact same qualification. And in my time, we suddenly got parity payment for similar qualifications with men in, in education. So I come from that time when we were fighting just for that basic right. At least those things are in place legislatively, even though they're not necessarily there in practice. But what I love about the conversation here is that it's not adversarial. It's no longer men against women. It's actually quite engaging. And I think that our responsibility to keep on reframing the conversation mm -hmm. as we evolve, as the different generations join the, uh, the conversation, is critical. Um, I think that the opportunity cost of us not pushing the conversation, of us not pushing the envelope, is very serious in our mm -hmm. country. We need to all be at these tables and be mm -hmm. part of the conversation. And so I just encourage all of you very brave women who are pushing those envelopes to continue doing that thing because it's not just about you furthering your own career, it's about us shifting society to actually create a richer reality for us all in this country. So I salute you and I'm so excited by the way you're thinking about this. Great. Uh, I very much want to echo your sentiments, Jules. I mean, I, I really think it's about, you know, fear is holding us back. I mean, the fact that we, we've spoken about these issues 10 years ago and we're still speaking about it. Um, there isn't radical transformation in terms of somebody stepping up to say, right, we're going to dismantle all of these issues with one, two, three and kind of approach. There's just so many different issues that, that need to be nuanced and handled very, very delicately. But I think my key message is, is pretty much like Jewel said, push the envelope. Um, don't be afraid to do so. Be bold, be brave. Um, stand up for who you are and be authentic in how you're doing it. Because that's really what's going to stand out um, in terms of how you are actually then going to persevere and move ahead and actually break that glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if, I think if, if each one of us actually ends up doing that, you actually then start moving collectively in the right direction that we want to get to, which is to break down all of these biases mm -hmm. that we see. From my side, communication, communications keeps speaking about these issues. Um, mm -hmm. It has been a very male-dominated world. If you look now at the leader of the U.S., Donald Trump, for me, that's like the old guy from yesteryear. But the Donald Trumps will come and they will go. And my, my take from today is I love the way that everybody has spoken out, spoken up and said, let's try it this way. Let's do it this way. Never let somebody put you down. Speak to them. And if they, if, if, if they don't give you the time to speak to them, then they're not a good leader. And you shouldn't be working with them. Mm. But speak up and don't take second place yeah. at all. Yeah, great. <laughs> if there's, you know, I went back to university after 20 years. And if there's one thing that it, it maybe raised for me again is this uh, notion of critical thinking. I think mm. if I were to leave it, that the one thing that, that if we can think about what we think about and why we think that way, so that we can excavate for the things that are not serving us mm -hmm. as women, as men, as communities, as organizations, that that would, must become one of the things that we really engage mm -hmm. with in community and uh, as individuals. You know, why, why are we here? Mm -hmm. Who are we? And, and to open up in a safe, to build safe, a lot of the work that I'm doing at the moment around collaboration and leadership and organization is creating safe environments 
mm. creating environments of psychological safety so that we can feel that we can bring our best. And then we can bring innovation and creativity and, and mm. uh, generativity back into mm. organizations. But we can't do those things if we're not safe. Mm. And discrimination and sexism and feeling mm. like we're not good enough does not create yeah. safe environments. So we really have to begin to think, uh, of how do I create my own safe environment? How do I push the envelope mm -hmm. and take ownership for creating safety for myself so I can be my best? And how mm -hmm. do I help in a community to generate the same and not mm -hmm. be a victim? Mm -hmm. I love this conversation. I think we're privileged to yeah. be here. And it, it's amazing to participate in it together. Mm -hmm. So I'm very excited. Yeah. So I, I just really want to thank everyone because these conversations aren't ever as rich unless you give of yourself and everybody has has got such interesting views and have shared interesting practices or dilemmas or challenges and it's that sharing that will make us stronger and and I guess what I'd really love to see is the amazing self-awareness in the room we all we are all aware of the problem we're starting to diagnose to critically think about it and i think it's through that process that we can start to move things forward so i really want to thank my panel but also thank you in particular for joining us today and i think audrey's going to make some final comments thank you jenny and um the panel actually made it very easy now with a very nice summary here at the beginning um i think some very interesting comments has come out of this uh, conversation today and we've heard uh, quite a number of uh, new uh, thinking on um, the unconscious biases, the um, DNA of an organization, masculine DNA, feminine DNA. I think it's going to make us think a lot um, going forward. Um, Jenny, I think this is officially now a series. Uh, it's not only one breakfast anymore. Um, we've got enough themes, enough to talk about to really continuously do this. Um, we need to start looking at making it more gender balanced mm -hmm. um, going forward. But uh, I think this is now something that we can take forward and, and build on this. Um, we also um, have, I think, a huge opportunity within Enli in terms of this gender balance. Um, we sit at the moment with between 40 to 50 percent uh, female students. So we're at that balance point now, 50-50. And um, I think there's a huge opportunity for us to start including all of this in our teaching and in our conversations and our dialogues in, in our uh, programs and in our talking uh, amongst the students. Uh, we've got that opportunity and we need yeah. to push this, that we start talking about this more. Mm. So um, I've got the privilege to say thank you to the panel. Thank you for being here and thank you for being so open and honest and sharing um, I think we're all inspired by what you've told us here um, from the stage and hopefully can go on with the conversation and also go and apply it in the workplace. So just a small gift of, of appreciation. <laughs> wow, <laughs> not so small. Jenny, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Audrey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. families to come along and join in the conversations. Um, I just want to mention we had an interesting realization the other day that um, there is this perception that if you're studying your MBA and you have to bring your partners, now we have to look after the wives and the children as the other halves. And then we realize that 42% of our MBA <laughs> students are now um, women. Mm -hmm. So the partners <coughs> are now male. Mm -hmm. So that changed the whole dynamic mm -hmm. in what you talk about when you talk to partners. Mm -hmm. So um, we 
we would love you to become part of this family and join us here at EMD and for the various programs that we offer. There's some information in the booklet yeah. if you need more details. Thank you. Great. Cool. Thanks Thank so much. You. Thank mm -hmm. you.